This particular diagram is a, a traditional wisdom sunburst. It has four cardinal directions and it has four ordinal bursts from the angles so that you have an eight-point star. And this is a traditional wisdom diagram. If you notice, at the very top, nature occurs, and uh, directly opposite it, on the lower part of this diagram, is vision. And that's where we start today. So that nature and vision are related together in such a way that they are an axis and in fact, they're the axis upon which the spin of reality occurs. Okay. So our second year begins with vision. And we need to, right away, make a complementation out of nature and vision. We said that nature was a matrix of change, that nature is a process and not at all some static reality. It's not a collection of things, but nature is a matrix of change. Vision is a matrix of consonants, a matrix of consonants. And this also could stand as a definition of consciousness. Consciousness is a matrix of consonants. Now consonants is a musical term and it is related to in a corollary uh, way the term resonance. resonance. A complete resonance is a consonance and they're related in such a way let's give an example the well-known example. If you have a room full of violins that are just leaning against chairs and one violinist and he plays the, plays the note, let's say the whole note um, A on his violin, all of the other violins in the room will resonate to A. They will play A. Not as loud as this violin, but nevertheless one could detect that. The fact that all of the violins play the same note is consonance. They will always play the same note, given the universal principle of consonance. It means that in a quiescent state, every sentient being in the universe will vibrate as soon as one sentient being in the universe achieves a thought which is out of pure realization. That's not metaphysics, that's science. The resonance is like the carrier. The constance is like the DNA. <laughs> So when we talk about differentiation in the second year, the carrier wave, the energy mode, is differentiation. And it works by resonance. One of the most important things to consider is that resonance and consonance are related, but nevertheless they are distinct. Could someone check the door downstairs? I think it blew open. Now, in our exploration of the first year, we followed integration from nature, from just its ordinary beginnings. Its beginnings where you live to take a walk, and that walk was then repeated and repeated a third time. And that was the beginning of your experience. We need some kind of a complementation, some kind of a, an assignment, if you will, a project, if you want, some kind of activity which will 
do in differentiation what the walk did in uh, integration. That project needs to involve consciousness rather than nature. Because vision has to do with consciousness. But vision occurring in a matrix of consonants is radically different from what the ego supposes it to be, of what the common mind expects it to be, of what the popular mind trusts that it is. It has a radically different structure. Its operation is markedly, distinctly different. And we need to begin to appreciate that. And so our project needs to concern that peculiar quality. The only thing that can deliver this quality is meditation. Or, if you will, using the Western tradition, contemplation. Those are the only activities which can deliver the matrix of consonants in such a way that your differential participation with it is accurately achievable. And so the first assignment is to set yourself at least three days in a row, any time during the next week, any three days in a row, and to choose a time to sit down and meditate for at least 10 minutes. And that time should be chosen so that you can do it on each of three days at the very same time. It doesn't matter what time it is. You're not to write down anything at all about those three meditation stints. Nothing. Just do them and let them go. Return as swiftly as you can, as easily, as casually as you can, back to what you were doing before. Make no preparation whatsoever for the meditation, other than to note the time, set an alarm clock if you need. We want to make a disjuncture between your common everyday activity. It doesn't matter what you do, whatever it is that you do. But we want the three meditation stints to be disjunctive. Now the assignment, the project, is to have paper and pen, or a little computer, laptop, whatever you write with, ready on the fourth day, ready in there at the time of meditation, but do not meditate. Continue to do whatever you're doing. But keep an awareness of what is happening in your experiential nature. Pay attention to your experience. And whatever occurs to you, write that down. Put that into written language, fresh, just as it occurs to you. Do not edit it. Do not think about it. Make it as close to automatic writing as you can. We dealt with Yeats, the vision, which was automatic writing. Now, the reason for this, not a rationale, a reason. We're dealing with the roots of science here. We're dealing with consciousness, not with nature. We're dealing with an energy that yields an exactness that one found in nature in consciousness. Consciousness is as exact as it needs to be. There is nothing whatsoever in the universe that is beyond the distinctive exactness of consciousness. Nothing. Let's think back now 
We started off with a diagram. Let's come back to that diagram. We note here that at the top of this diagram, nature, and at the bottom of it, vision. Both nature and vision are processes. They're not objective phases. They're phases of process. In between the process phase of nature and the process phase of vision, there is only one process phase. In between those two, there's only one process phase, which is myth. Myth is the only one that's in between. So that if you set your meditation to take place exactly at the same time, three days in a row, and you do not maintain it consciously, the fourth day, the occurrence will slip automatically back to the previous phase, back to myth, back to experience, and you will experience something. And it will be distinctly a mythic language experiential happening. But if it remained in myth, it would at this particular juncture be lost very quickly. That's why you must write it down. Because the essence of differential consciousness is to make a discursive notation. This takes it out of experience, this takes it out of myth, and puts it into vision. Now the old traditional name for vision was magic. The essence of magic is a written symbol. It's only in the movies that the magician says apricadabra. A real magician would write it down and use it that way. When we see Cecil B. DeMille having Moses raise his staff and say, part to the Red Sea, that's myth. But to write down the name of that geographical crossing in the sand with the staff, those waters part. There's a monumental difference. And the difference between myth and magic is mind. The difference between myth and vision is symbol. And from the experiential process, symbols are higher powers. They're further along the line in integration. So that symbols index experience but symbols do not index magic. They do not index vision. Vision is more powerful. It dissolves symbols and uses the solution of symbols so that vision is remarkably, radically, unbelievably different from symbols. Symbols are integrative. They work with integration. They bring integration to a focus, whereas vision is the beginning of a differential process, is a completely different thing. It's on the other side of the hourglass. And we need to appreciate this radical difference. Otherwise, the second year of the course becomes misunderstood in a, in a strategic way. I mean to say that, yeah, in a strategic way. We're not just doing more of the same. Our investigations now, our doing of events is no longer in an integrative 
mode, but is in a differential mode. Now it's been very difficult to find the exact right pair of texts to begin that. That pair of texts, because we want to keep the textual pair quality, which we had in the first year, all the way through the second year. If you have a methodological technique that one uses, it must apply to the whole structure. Otherwise, the whole structure will not gel. You have to keep the same methodology. And so the whole reason for having a pair rather than a single text, in order to keep the radical change focused with a single text, one would have to be an international genius, a universal first-class intellect to be able to follow that. It's mind-boggling. I can't do that. But with a pair of texts, almost anyone who puts the activity into a serious mode of endeavor will be able to carry it through. It's an everyman version. It's a Walt Whitman democratic version of the super yogi. There isn't anyone here who can't do that. But it does take actual doing. You cannot just think about it. Why? Because the imaginative function is a mythic quality and has no efficacy in vision whatsoever. To put it in uh, surprising language, imagination short circuits magic. There's no such thing as an imaginative magician. Bad storyline. Miscasting. What works in vision is memory. And the memnonic function is extremely powerful when it is used in its differential energy form. When memory is made to reduce itself, to be squeezed down and made to be somehow in the shoes of imagination, so that memory is some kind of function similar to imagination. Memory lies. It is in a repressed mode and it tends to become clever rather than accurate. One tends to remember what the ego needs rather than what is true, what is actual. And when that happens, you undercut the entire ground upon which the process of history could occur. And that's why nobody who doesn't mature out of the mythic mode into the vision mode has any way of participating reality as a historical process. So that history is an extremely rare phenomenon. Almost no one that one would meet he is able to function in the process phase of history. And if we look back to our diagram again, let's come back. We notice that the four cardinal points are phase processes, or process phases. At the very top was nature. And we characterized nature as a matrix of change. Nature is always happening. It's always ongoing. It never is in any static mode whatsoever. There is no such thing as a natural material that is just there. It never is just there. The vibrational qualities of, quote, just their matter are astonishing. <laughs> Every single electron does its pirouette. Every single one of them is doing a spin. Every atomic constituent 
has its movement in action. Nature is a matrix of change. It's not there. There's no there there. That's what Gertrude Stein said about Oakland, right? <laughs> but there's no there there. That's why she's in Paris, in her salon, with her Picasso and her demi tasse. Because they're there, but one is using them up. And so they're much more real. Nature is meant to be worked with, to be participated in. And that's why action is real. <laughs> what one does is objective. That really happens. And it really happens in such a way that it is indelible. The ancient Egyptian wisdom was very clear about this. And we use it because it's the earliest recorded wisdom on this particular planet, on this particular matter. Once Ra has done the action of rising to create that day, that day exists forever. That day is an indelible compartment of light in the universe, and it doesn't matter how non-real the vacuity of an extensive universe would be, that cube of light that Ra made by rising on that day is there forever. And when he rises a second day, that light cube adjoins itself to that first light cube and is there forever. There is not only no devil strong enough to erase it, there's no God strong enough to erase it. There's no principle that could ever abolish it. So that actions really done, once done, exist forever. This is the whole basis of ethics. Be careful about what you do because that really not only happens, but it stays happened. And once somebody gets that, they stop fucking up. Understand that? They stop messing up because they realize that these actions are the indelible, accurate, atomic base upon which experience then occurs. If one then does a judicious selection of actions, your experience will be increasingly clear, increasingly have that quality of jewel-like scintillation. And the mind that comes out of that experience will be open, will be unencumbered. So like in our diagram, nature at the very top as a process phase is related to vision at the very bottom as a process phase in a complementary way. They complement each other. They go together. They go together because they form the polar axis of a double movement. The sphere spins in a double movement. It goes clockwise and counterclockwise at the very same time. So that if one had the mystic eye of being able to, uh, to merge with the entire universe so that one could see the manifest universe, it would look like a shimmering pearl. From the super yogi who in his contemplative action is 100 trillion years away, the 20 billion light year universe that we live in looks like shimmering pearl, like iridescent pearl in a velvet openness. It's a pearl of great price. Have you ever heard of it? It is a quality. It is a quality of wholeness that is ensured because it has already happened. It's indelibly real. It's there. 
But in between nature as a process phase and vision as a process phase, the only other process phase, the only other movement phase that there is, is myth. So let's come back to the assignment. Let's understand the reasoning behind the assignment. The assignment is, sometime during this week, to pick three days in a row the same time and to meditate or to contemplate or to pray, however you quiet yourself down. To meditate or contemplate at the same time for three days and to make that as casual an experience as possible. If you're washing dishes, just put the towel down and, and sit. And after 10 minutes, go back, finish washing that dish. We want to make that meditative 10 minutes disjunctive. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to do anything about it. Just forget it. Let it go. But on the fourth day, at that exact time, do not meditate. Do not pray. Do not contemplate. But instead, have your writing material, have your laptop, well, however you record, and write down as close to automatic writing as you can what you experience. And you will have an experience. Experience will be there because it will have a space that's been made by vision left completely open. And because it's open, the space will be a notation there by consciousness, but the content will be there courtesy of your mythic experience phase process, whatever it is, however it operates. It will then operate in that space. It's like a computer program that sets a form template on the screen. The form template is there, though you cannot see it. And as soon as you type anything onto that screen, it goes into that format. It has to. Why? Because it's made to do that. It's designed. Consciousness is a designer. And in vision, consciousness learns to be such a good designer that out of vision comes the artist who is a consummate designer. He's an artist. She's an artist. And we'll see that the art of person making comes out of the memnonic functioning in vision of keeping a matrix of consonants active. So that when we use the kind of language which we'll use in about three months, when we say that the person is real, the person is indelibly real, once a person is brought together, there's nothing that's going to dissolve that person. <coughs> you exist forever. So take a little care about how you're going to be forever. You don't have to force anyone to adopt any kind of morality whatsoever. Once someone understands what's going on, they'll take care of their own ethic much better than you could have with laws or anything else. So we can say this now. This is the first page of notes for 1995. Nature is a matrix of change. Consciousness is a matrix of consciousness is a matrix of consonants. You don't have to be a computer programmer to know this. One of the greatest symbols in the world, one of the greatest written symbols in the world, it's at least 60,000 years old, is the Australian Aborigine symbol for consciousness, which is a target, which is concentric circles coming out from a central dot. And even before they got to Australia, 60,000 years ago, traipsing around in, in the mud of what is now the Sulu Sea, Human beings, men and women, understood 
this is what it is. But they did not have a differential content at that time to go into that space. All they had was the marker that that space exists because they had had realization. So the content that went into that realization space was mythic experience, and that's why they called it the dream time. Because dreams are mythic, and they're experiential. But they fit into a conscious space, and that's why they're not just dreams, but it's a religious vision. I wish I could speak French and say, n'est-ce pas, sweetie? <laughs> so that we're getting to a place now where you can talk in exact language and say something that really shakes the foundations of what people call life, civilization, psychology, physics, you name it. With this kind of crowbar, with this kind of lever, you're in the Archimedean position of being able to lift the whole world. Lifting one world is nothing. You can lift the pearl of the universe. All right, let's come back. We're noticing that nature and vision work as a complementation, and the language that we learned in the integral cycle was that they form a pair. In fact, the methodology that we're carrying all the way through is to take books as a pair, a pair of texts, two books at the same time, the methodology of a pair, because the paredness, as Lanza says in the Tao Te Ching, at the deepest root of what is, is paredness. But one of our pairs of text, the beginning vision, is the Gathas of Zarathustra. And the very core of the Gathas of Zarathustra is in the 30th Gatha. The very first hot of the 30th Gatha, the very first um, stanza of the first song, is the philosophic core of all of Zarathustra's work, and it's very ancient. How ancient? It's very ancient. About 4,400 years ago, already, someone could not only say but write, and in my translation it reads this way. Now I speak to you seekers. In pairs, Mazda creates wisdom. And Ahura is the beginning of praise, while prayer is in Vohumanu. And insight moves as Asha, as stars constellating paradise. It is unbelievably beautiful. It is so elegant that when one understands that someone could have written this 4,400 years ago, you keep your mouth shut in great humility about what progress is. That's cool. That's unbelievable to be able to say that and know that you say that and write that down that elegantly is incredible. One of the world's greatest teachers, beyond doubt. Contemporaneous with um, Old uh, Kingdom uh, Egypt. Now, I speak to you seekers in pairs, Mazda creates wisdom. So that this paired quality, paired quality, has a resonance. Milarepa used to do that. It's a mudra, it's a symbol, and then he used to smile. He used to have these nice gold earrings, long hair. had greenish uh, skin left over from the days when uh, the only thing that he had to eat was uh, 
he would hold his hand in uh, meditation and uh, rainwater would collect in it and the occasional pine needle that would fall in the rainwater. He would heat that up by his body, uh, heat, his tumo, and he would make a little soup out of that. And that's, he existed on that for many years. And, and so his skin was not uh, a disease, but it was, uh, definitely had a greenish tinge. It, it means everything that is paired in the universe has a level at which it is resonant with every other pair in the universe. So that if one uses a single pair in the exact right way, all of the other paredness in the universe vibrates resonantly with that. That single pair goes under the name in music, we still preserve it. It's an esoteric principle, but it's preserved in music because the way in which Western music came out is very esoteric. It's called a tuning fork. And if you strike a tuning fork, it will sound one note. It doesn't sound a pair of notes. It sounds one note. And if you have a sequence of tuning forks in a limited order, eight of them called an octave. With that octave, with those eight tuning forks, you can tune any instrument to resonate to that particular key. And if you have 11 eights in a row, you have a piano. <laughs> The esoteric piano should have 12. This should be a 96 key piano, but it's very difficult to hear and compose with uh, those extra four <laughs> on either end. Sometime in the next century, a, another Schoenberg will come along and he will compose 12 tone music for a 12 part piano. You know, it'll be exquisite music. Whether we can hear it or not, that's another tone. Because it won't be experiential music, it'll be conscious magic. Now, in what we're doing here, we want to take our pair of texts and make it our first tuning fork. Now, what would, what would we pair up with an ancient wisdom like Zarathustra? comes from ancient Iranian wisdom. The only thing that I could find to really pair it up with, because it's long before there was any written language in India, the, the earliest written language in India is around 1600 BC, the Rig Veda. The first songs of the Rig Veda do not predate 1600 BC. So I couldn't use anything from India. It's too late. I could use something contemporaneous to Zarathustra from Mesopotamia. I could have used uh, Inanna. I could have used the Epic of Gilgamesh. But this limits it somewhat by keeping it within one river valley civilization. So I wanted to have something that was a little bit outside, and so I went to Egypt, because Egypt is a place where there is a written language at that time, and the consonant pair with Zarathustra from that time period is the ancient Egyptian Hermetic writing, which comes down in several translated versions of the original written. The first translation is in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which comes from about 1800 BC. It comes from about 400 years after the original was uh, written down. But the Egyptian Book of the Dead is very, very difficult to deal with because that translated form uh, for us is very archaic. But fortunately, the gist of the Egyptian Book of the Dead was brought back into play in a translation in 
late Hellenistic times, around 90 AD. And it appears as the first hermetic treatise, the Poimandres, the Poimander, the mind shepherd. So I'm using the hermetic, the first hermetic treatise, the mind shepherd, paired with Zarathustra, the Gathas of Zarathustra, because that pair is the tuning fork that begins our whole quest for this year about differential consciousness, the differential energy that is consciousness, the exploration of the matrix of consonants, and performs a similar kind of function for us as when last year, at the very beginning, we used the I Ching and Thoreau's journals. Because when you're investigating the universe of integration, beginning with the natural mode, the process of change, the matrix of change, using the I Ching is, is the most accurate way in which to uh, begin that exploration. And curiously enough, Thoreau's journals are about as close as you can come to the kind of, quote, Chinese mysticism that's there in the I Ching. Thoreau's a much better Taoist than almost anybody that you would find. If one takes the Taoist frame of recognition into Thoreau's journals, you read that and the thing lights up like a jeweled necklace because he sees quite naturally in that way. Why is a very uh, interesting and esoteric thing. Just suffice it to say, he grew up in a format of freedom created by Franklin and Jefferson and friends like Madison and so forth. People like Lincoln and Thoreau grew up in a place where the format of conscious freedom and openness was there, but there was no content put there for them preemptively, and so their own experience fell into a conscious form. And so when one reads the young Thoreau, one reads someone who has a superior conscious format and a complete openness as to letting it be, its content be filled by his actual experience. I don't know if you know, but this uh, makes universal geniuses. Uh, Thoreau, by the time he was uh, 18 years old, he was at Harvard, he made his own translations of Aeschylus from the Greek at age 18. I don't know if you know, but translating Aeschylus as Greek is unbelievably difficult. 200 years later, with all of the academic uh, uh, textbooks and dictionaries and grammars that never existed at that time. And if you go to the Huntington Library here in Los Angeles, you can see the original autograph of Thoreau's translations of Aeschylus, and they damn well hold up. The universal genius. He also read about a dozen other languages, including Icelandic, and he was only 19 at the time that he dropped out of Harvard because he wasn't getting anywhere. Yeah. Americans are not as naive as we're made out to be. And so people like Thoreau and Lincoln and Whitman and Melville had universal consciousness structures that were completely unpopulated by any content other than their experience. And so when their experience was broad and got broader, it made a resonance throughout their minds. So Whitman went to primordial yogic experience. Melville went to the South Seas to live with cannibals in primeval uh, South Sea Paradise, uh, Thoreau went into his Taoist New England uh, explorations of standing with the trees in snowstorms because somebody needed to do that. And Lincoln learned to have a mind as completely evenly balanced as 
somebody who remembered that he could hold two axes straight out with his hands for hours on end. He had that kind of strength and equanimity, but it also translated into his personality. So when it came to holding the vision of the United States as a single visionary unity together in a time when both halves were killing each other massively, he could do that. And he said, with all humility, he said, you can fool most of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people, meaning himself, at any time. So we're using Zarathustra in his Gathas and the ancient Hermetic wisdom in the Mind Shepherd Hermetic Treatise as our first pair of texts. And because of the way in which they've been mishandled, if you forgive me, we're going to use my translation of Zarathustra and uh, my stylization of the uh, Poimander. I've already gone through all of these things. Here's the Gathas of Zarathustra, complete, translated with uh, annotation, and the complete hermetic treatises uh, put into a conscious uh, translated form. Let's take a break and then we'll come back. If you remember, those of you who were here a year ago exactly, we asked a question frequently at that time. And the question was, what are we doing? And the question was meant partially rhetorically, what are we doing? And Partially, it was like a string around our fingers. One finger, or I'm not sure if the S should be there. It's like a string around our finger to remind us to be attentive, to focus what are we doing. Why are we here on a rainy Saturday morning slogging through this town, if you can call it a town? L.A. is sort of like a swamp of civilization. It's the Oki Finoki of cities. You've got to be a real cracker just to get around. That's a double entendre for you Georgia fans. What are we doing? Why are we here? Why are we not someplace else? Why next week will we not be here? Or why will we come back again? We're trying to educate ourselves. And we know, because all of us have tried to educate ourselves alone or in other venues, in other ways, and we know that it's very difficult. It's difficult to educate ourselves in such a way that we can have an easier time at a better life. Or at least, if you're more courageous, to understand more of why it is that they, they do these things to you and who are they anyway. And what kind of a you are you that they can get at you with their they-ness. It's sort of Heideggerian in a way. <laughs> What makes Dasein do it? What kind of Urgriffheit is going on around here? What are we doing? We're trying to educate ourselves. And that this education that is available to you is very rare. It almost never happens. And in the past, in history, it only happened occasionally for royalty. It was only for kings. One of the most famous and profound 
manuscripts, books, to come out of Western civilization was written about 1267 by a man named Roger Bacon. It was called Secrets of Secrets. And it was the his rendition of the personal education of Aristotle for Alexander the Great. It was the royal road to self-realization for the king's ears only. And only someone who really was first class mind would be able to deliver that to that rare king. Can you imagine what a bestseller it would be to have Merlin's instructions for King Arthur? <laughs> this is it. You got it. But because this is not the Middle Ages, this is not the late Roman antiquity, this is almost 21st century America. This education is made for men and women by the tens of millions to take advantage of so that they can not only figure out what's going on for themselves, but they can get together in effective ways and do whatever they need to do to allow for their lives to be what they would like them to be. Now, a family is a resonance of a person, and a community is a resonance of a family, and a country is a resonance of a community, and the planet is a resonance of that entire country. But you cannot start that process until there's someone there, because all of it is consonant upon that first occurrence. One of the very first lessons that one learned in the 1980s from chaos theory is that you have to have a starting point. And if you exactly know the characteristic ordination of the starting point, you can predict with exact accuracy, even with random movement, what you will get in terms of the pattern. And that pattern always is controlled in its design by the universal function of the double attractor, the pair of attractions, and there is no way that that can be erased from the universe because it's there in the template before there was any content whatsoever. And our brains work that way, galaxies work that way, vibrating grains of sand under the photography of Hans Jenny work that way. Whatever the vibration is, matter has to take that form. <laughs> it doesn't have any spurred boots where it can dig in and say no. It has to take that form because that's the nature of its reality. If we send the right vibration out, our lives will be in the form of that consonance. Whatever we send out. That's what it will be. And one of the bitter lessons in higher meditation, like advanced Vipassana meditation, is to find that the only mucking up that goes on is what you do. <sighs> and so one patiently learns to do what you really want to do. My friend Theodore Sturgeon said it's a salvation in a way because out of the 10 million things that could happen, only one really will. And anybody's got enough power to control one action at a time. <laughs> the whole hourglass of possibility that overwhelms you comes down to just one real possibility at any given instant. And as long as you maintain the sequence from that instant, there's no way that this universe can be any other than what that is. 
And so in the Gathas of Zarathustra, Gatha 30, the second stanza, Zarathustra says, 4,400 years ago, listen with inner ears best and see in your aurora mind two ways differentiate by choice each a person or an ego either before any great aeon happens best for you awaken each to teach streamline unbelievable Now, in order to get our education in the second year off to a start, we not only have a pair of texts, Zarathustra and the Hermetic Treatise, the Poimandris, the Mind Shepherd. We not only have a pair of texts, <coughs> but that pairing of texts occurs within a template structure within a form which we have used all the first year and we're going to use again the second year. And the structure is outlined in our ecumeny pamphlet and those of you who are just coming in will make copies for you. The vision, the format of vision looks exactly like the format of nature from a year ago. It's the very same format. And let's just review what that format is, because each of the eight sections of this course have the very same methodological format, which is to say it is designed upon the universal principle of carrying pairs, just like a pair of legs you can walk with, just like a pair of hands you can come together with, a pair of eyes you can focus with, a pair of halves of the brain you can multidimensional with. <coughs> the format is this. The first stable structure is not the pair. The pair is a dynamic structure, but the first stable structure is a pair of pairs. A pair of pairs is stable. That's why a square has four corners. It's two paired. So that the universal symbol for stability is a square. You can be in any star system, on any planet. Those sentient beings will recognize a square as a symbol of stability. The quaternary structure of psychic energy is stable. So that when you come into objectivizing in life, you want to make sure that at some place in the sequence, there's a square, a stability that's there. That's how you build. You cannot build a house without a foundation. There's no way to build a life without a foundation. There's no way to have a mind without a foundation. There's no way to be a person without a foundation. That foundation is, quote, the square that is made in the stabilizing phase that is operative when it comes to being a person, the stabilizing phase that's operative is art. Literally, spiritual persons are works of art. They literally are works of art. Every person that you ever will meet who is real is a work of art. They deserve the appreciation and respect of, of the most expensive Van Gogh you could, you could hope to ever want to buy. Every single human person, every single sentient being in the universe who achieves that personhood has that quality. 
regardless of whatever planetary system they occur in. They have that. What, what is that quality? They are prisms of a differential energy, which is in a matrix of consonants, that leads from an unseen realization to the spectrum of the cosmos. And we share with those spiritual persons, no matter in what star system they occur, we share the realization and the cosmos. We share those in common. We are all in the same cosmos. We are all differential <coughs> consonances of the same realization. That's why one of the famous questions to, to the Buddha, one of, one of the really highly intelligent uh, uh, monks at the time, Moggallala, he put the question to him. He said, in your universal sentience, is there any being that has ever achieved enlightenment by a method different from the one that you teach? And his answer was, in the billions upon trillions of kotis, K-O-T-I-S, which means jillions, not one. And pursuing it, Mokalala says, well, in the future, will there ever be any sentient being on in any place in the uh, tripartite uh, chilichasm, as they you, uh, translate it in English, <coughs> means everywhere, all the time, ever in the future, uh, how many? And he said, uh, not a single one. And so astonished, Mogalala said, well, how many are there who will follow this method, who will achieve enlightenment? And he said, as many times the grains of the sands of the Ganges as the grains of the sands of the Ganges. Exponential. <laughs> Unlimited, virtually. Uncountable. So not only is enlightenment not rare, it is darn well common enough to be called endemic. <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> The big deal is to stop pretending that the weekend with Guru so-and-so is going to do anything. Because if Guru so-and-so were even the least bit enlightened, would not be offering weekends to guys like you for something called money. In Hollywood they say, hey! Wake up, sucker. <coughs> this education is serious. It's a serious endeavor. Yeah, just because it isn't world famous, we can add the saving grace. It isn't world famous yet. <laughs> so take advantage of it. I would not have offered it again. If my daughter had not died, I wouldn't be here. And after this year, I'm not going to be here. So take advantage of it. It's there. And the piddling little $25 a week is nothing. Check what this intuition at Stanford is. Or USC. It's nothing. This is a much better education than you could find anywhere. And it will work for you forever. Not only as long as you live here, but as long as you are. This kind of thing is indelible. It will always work. How come you don't have famous students uh, around who are doing fantastic things? How do you know I don't? <laughs> The structure, each quarter, is exactly the same because it's built upon stability. But instead of having a static stability, I have a stability that's interlinked so that the stability of one phase 
fits into the stability of the following phase. So that two phases together, the one phase has one part missing, like an indentation. The other phase has an extra part sticking out like a pin, and so they fit together. They fit together. But when they fit together, they fit together in such a way that the indentation and the pin dissolve into each other and form two cubes, as it were. So that the, the doubleness retains its paired quality and yet is capable of a unification. It's not as esoteric as it sounds. Here's a pair of hands, one sound. I know that they told you that the esoteric thing is the sound of one hand clapping, but it's much more esoteric that there should be one sound with two hands clapping. If you look at vision, if you look at the way in which the eyes see, the pair of eyes see, they only can see one focus at a time. They cannot see two focuses at a time. They see only one focus at a time. And it's simply that our neural nets are used to a rapid movement that we get the pixel-like quality of the illusion that there's a picture out there. There's no picture out there. So that when you sleep, it takes an REM, rapid eye movement, in order to get the pixels for the images for the dreams. But in deep trance, there's no eye movement whatsoever. You learn to quiet down, to calm down, so that the pair of eyes sees exactly what's there. And in deep samadhi, in deep trance, when vision is quieted down to absolute zero, you look completely through the universe. You don't see nothing. That's not a double negative. Because there's nothing there to be seen. There's no illusion there to be seen. It doesn't mean that this is not real. It doesn't mean that at all. It has, has no connotation for that. That's, there's no inference of that at all. But what it means is that the reality is a vision which is held by a movement and that that movement in consciousness is differential and not integral. It's not integral at all. I'm having a supper tonight with the president of the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. And my first question will be, oh, what it always is. Where is your differential studies institute? I don't pursue it. I don't follow it up. It's the very first question every single time. The stability is that we take a pair of texts three times and we take a seventh text in the fourth place, just one text in the fourth place. So each quarter, we divide the whole year into four, a stability of a pair of pairs into four. And we divide each one of those four into four. And we fill the first three corners of the square of each quarter, but we have only one text in the fourth part. We use the first pair of texts for a month. We use the second pair of texts for a month. We use the third pair of texts for a month. We use the seventh text by itself for a single week. So that that square is made, it's stable, but its stability depends upon an interlinking, an interfacing interlinking with the next quarter. 
Why is that so? Because the beginning phase, both years, the real beginning phase, both years, are process phases and they're not objectively there at all. And it would be a colossal lie to make them stable. You begin with nature, which is a process phase, and we begin with vision, the second year, which is again a process phase. So it has to be consistent with what is real. And when we add ritual to nature, we get the first stability. And when we add art to vision, we get the first stability. So that the triggers for objectivity in this education, in the first year, are ritual comportment, what we do, action. And in the second year, who we are, the person, in art. You have to learn to put art and person together, just like we learn to put ritual and action together. Because one of the obscuring veils we saw in ritual was that people identify ritual with stupid habit. Oh, rituals are stupid habit. It's not that at all. Rituals are a selective activity, selected out of nature, selected out of the matrix of change, in order to give us a vectored comportment that is repeatable. That's why the sequencing quality to all primordial ritual is the drum beat or the dancing feet. It's the way in which the repeatable quality of action comportment is secured. And so it comes as a very wise saying when some elder tribal member, doesn't matter what tribe, where in the world, when some elder tribal member says, don't trust anyone who doesn't dance with our people. I mean, if the anthropology professors are not dancing with the people, well then tell them what they would like to know and collect the beads and let them go home. But if they dance with the people, then bring them into the tribe. So that ritual and nature together form the first objective pair. And that is the core of what integration is, is to know that. But not to know that in a conscious way, but to know that in the body. Because the body is the place where that records. And that's why ritual has to do with existence. It has nothing to do with ideas. It has nothing to do with anything else. It has to do with existence. And so nature comes into existence because something real happens in an action. The Tao Te Ching, which I'm finishing up my translation of, says that Tao when it moves, is te. Zero, when it moves, is one. The first movement of zero is one. One is not differentiable from zero. One is integrable from zero. That's why one holds as one in a cardinal sequence. Otherwise, it wouldn't hold. Because differentiation moves by ordinal powers, but integration moves by cardinal sequencing. And one would not stay one unless it were a movement of zero. And because that is true and maintains itself and is stable, two is a movement from one.
and one can count. And the counting holds. It holds its articulation and has efficacy in this universe, which is a matrix of change. And this matrix of change will filter itself into the compartmentalization of numbers because of this actuality. And the first person to ever know that was Pythagoras. The first person to really know that was Pythagoras. And so he said the universe is made of number. Not that its content is made of number, but that its cardinal sequencing stability always follows an arithmetical linearity. And however long that arithmetical linearity is, if you put a finger at the center of that linearity, no matter how long you make it, if you put your finger at the center of that linearity, the two chords on either side will sound consonant notes. It's a universal principle. And if you put a Another finger at the halfway mark of the half, those four then will have a kind of a very special relationship that always holds. And when you make ratios of two to three, or three to four, or four to five out of this, you get consonant sounds which are whole, and they work just like whole numbers work. And a musical third and a musical fifth work because the ratio holds. And those ratios would not hold if the arithmetical place was not established by objective stability in the universe. There would be a silent universe. There would be no, no sound whatsoever, as a matter of fact. So let's, and notice now we're taking a weaving technique. Let's come back to Zartusha. Let's come back to the 30th Gatha. Let's come now to the third hot, to the third stanza. These paired primordial spirit ways, when in a polarity mind, then appears in thought and word particularity as are deeds, either good or bad. And of this pair, those wise choose the bright, never the dark ignorance. It's very precise. It's almost like a master Pythagorean mathematician saying exactly what is true universally. So when you're dealing with vision, don't look for the complete perfected stability in what we're doing this next three months. But take what we're doing the next three months in a way that it's going to dovetail into the following three months in such a way that those two together will form something objective. So by midsummer, by the end of June, you'll be able to look back in retrospect. It's a Pythagorean technique. Retrospect. What is retrospect? Retrospect is using memory on a chronological reverse sequencing. What is a retrospect? A retrospect starts from where you are and thinks back in a reverse chronology back all the way to the beginning. But you cannot do that unless one has set up a template of chronological formatting in order to be able to go back through that. And so the third quarter of this year is history. And almost nobody has ever done history right.
Possibly because I'm a schlock teacher. Who knows? But there's no way to get into the process phase of history without having understood cardinal chronology and be able to remember your way back through it and then be able to understand consciously what the shapes are that have occurred in that double order, in that pair of orders. And what those shapes are, are the actual forms that have occurred and control that history. History is a very strange thing. It is so strange that the whole human race is immersed in a swamp, the backwaters of a history that cannot be lived through to completion. Because almost nobody knows what history is and how to live in it. And there's no way to get to the cosmos without first going across the ocean of history. You cannot get there. There's no way. Why? Because the cosmos, its reality is precipitated out of the process ocean of history. That's why the god of the cosmos was called the lord of history as early as 5,000 years ago. What's the epithet of Ra in the hieroglyphics of the first pyramid text? Ra is the lord of history, the lord of millions of years, because he knows exactly how each day really or happened because he made them. And he knows how to remember all the way back through to the beginning. And by having mastered that double order, he is God of the cosmos. Not hopefully, really. On that level, on that level, the maturation of sentient beings on this planet or any other planet becomes, as the valley girls say, awesome. <laughs> and you get those kind of New Yorker cartoons where all the, the Manhattanites are looking at the sunset saying, author, author. <laughs> you get a weird kind of sense of humor that seems hokey to the uninitiated, but it's unbelievable. One is so awesomely relieved that God is real, that you, you can hardly believe it. But they said, well, tell with them, literally. So in vision, as we're going through it, you have to recognize that there's a very complex procedure that's happening, but don't keep track of it as a complexity. Just simply do what you're doing. I'll keep track of the complexity. That's my function. I don't ever lose place. I've taught since 1965. I've never missed a lecture. I've taught here uh, in this place for um, 5,456 days. I've never not been there. I'm trustworthy. Like Abe Lincoln with those axes, I will be there. I will keep track of that. All you have to do is show up and show up and show up. And you're showing up in a regularity will meld with my discipline of keeping the template there. There's no such thing as an unconscious. There's no such thing. It's just an integration that somebody has lost track of. It's a template order that someone didn't remember. But it's always there. The great popularizer of the unconscious, Jung, had over his own doorway, <laughs> called or uncalled, God will be there. 
His peasant quality deep down knew the right thing, even though professionally world famous doctor talking about the unconscious, his peasant bones knew called or uncalled. There's nothing unconscious about God at all. In fact, one can say quite accurately, there's nothing unconscious about God. He's unnameable, not because of not known, unnameable because names are inferior labels for what he is. He doesn't wear Gucci wings. <laughs> it's absurd. So part of my function in the second year is to occasionally be ebullient so that you think, well, oh, geez, what in the hell is he seeing? Wish I could see that. Or to be sort of uh, raspy. What are you doing? Or encouraging. Great. Or challenging. How do you know? Or something like that. <laughs> or irreverent. Or whatever it is. Is to keep it mixed up so that you don't regress and slide back into what is the most convenient mode for you to operate in now, which is mythic. And because mythic is a process, it's not objective, people slide out of myth very, quote, unconsciously back into ritual. They go back to the exact habits that they last were in touch with. People go back to their bones. You educate people, you get them really sophisticated, they go through all sorts of stuff, they become fantastically aware, and at a certain level, all of a sudden, they're behaving exactly like they did before. <laughs> and you say, but, and they say, well, I've done all that. I need to do this. Why, why are you giving up this, this beautiful diet and you're eating bologna sandwiches with French's mustard? Because that's how his mother raised him. That's where that ritual came from. And so Lao Tzu says, of the 10,000 things, what can be named is their mother. It's a double entendre. All of that can be stepped through, not circumvented, not ignored, not overpowered, but stepped through by maintaining this methodology and by just showing up, showing up, showing up, showing up. It is truly magical. It has this efficacy. And it's like having learned to ride a bicycle, you never had to compute aerodynamic stabilities by learning to ride a bicycle. You just did it. One of the famous uh, cases in the 1950s when I was in engineering at the University of Wisconsin, they used to always uh, have you work out the aerodynamics of why bees can't fly. They're too heavy for such short wings. They, they, they cannot fly. You can see it in the mathematics and the aerodynamics on the page. They cannot fly. But the bees don't pay any attention to that. They fly. They all fly. It's the same thing here. If you just show up all year, at the end of this year, it'll be there. It might take a while for it to kick in, but after a while, at some point, you will just find that you're using it. It's just there. Just there like that. One of my ex-students is uh, one of the head shuttle controllers for NASA. He's the only one that has mastered the mathematics of getting to the moon. Because the mathematics of getting to the moon involved very complex frame of reference phase sequencing. Literally, you could mathematically only move one frame of reference at a time. And you had to string them out in order to be able to get there. You couldn't just go. And it takes a very peculiar kind 
of quality to be able to appreciate how that works, that it's not mechanical, it's not a mechanical cardinal sequencing, but it's an ordinal accumulation that occurs gratis and mystically because one was accurate in the cardinal sequencing and remembered what it was, and those two movements together made it happen for real. There's nothing more esoteric. It's the triumph of the whole species. And it's not because of Texas jet pilot quipping that they got to the moon, but because men and women understood how to work that exact mathematics to an art. Literally, going to the moon was a mechanical ballet choreographed by a conscious vision. And the two fit together because that's how reality works. Now once one understands that, that pas de deux that is possible in your own lives is unlimited. It doesn't matter what you want to do, you can find a way to actualize that. This is not weekend guru success cheerleading. This is the way that sentient beings all over this universe live the life that they're really in. They really do it. By the trillions of trillions is not a big thing. But you cannot get there in a piecemeal fashion like making a chaos quilt. Well, you could if you could do every action there is. If you did every action that there is in all of its variants, that crazy chaos quilt would be real. But only up until that point, it would be unreal. And unless you can do every action that there is with all of its variants, try this. You say, geez, 52 weeks. $25 is a thousand bucks. In order to keep this pair all the way through, we have a pair of books that we read for the whole year. Last year it was Moby Dick and the Odyssey. This year it's the Aeneid and the Canterbury Tales. Choose one or the other. Now just because the Odyssey was by a man and Moby Dick was by a man, they were not both masculine. The Odyssey was a feminine journey. The Canterbury Tales is a feminine journey. The Aeneid is a masculine journey. You can take either one, but take only one. Here's how the Canterbury Tales begins, the prologue. It's appropriate for today. When April with his showers has pierced the draught of March with sweetness to the very root, and flooded every vein with liquid power. That of its strength engendereth the flower. When Zephyr also with his fragrant breath has urged to life in every holt and heath new tender shoots of green, and the young sun his full half course within the ram hath run, Ares, and little birds are making melody that sleep the whole night through with open eye, for in their hearts doth nature stir them so. Then people, longing on pilgrimage to go, and psalmers to be seeking foreign strands of melody, to distant shrines renowned in sundry lands, and then from every English countryside, especially to Canterbury, they ride. There to the holy sainted martyr kneeling that in their sickness sent them help and healing. So the Canterbury Tales is a journey to get well. And all that Chaucer's interested in, he's not interested in the masculine qualities of what medicine or healing is. He's interested in the people who are going. Who are they? His only concern, as he says, is a fair field full of folk. 
He's interested in the people. He's interested in the wife of Bath, for instance, who says, I know what women want. And Chaucer tantalizes and says, Don't you wouldn't you really like to know what women really want? What do they want? They want control of their husband's thoughts. <laughs> With that, they can plan. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side, the men, yes, Chaucer is humorous. He's very humorous. Ch Chaucer, was a, Chaucer was the king of England's wine merchant. And uh, he used to wear uh, red velvet suits with matching red velvet hat. And he used to go off to places like France and Italy about every year and go and get the best uh, uh, seasonal wine for the king. And the king had plenty of money, could buy whatever he wanted, whatever vintage. And so Cha Chaucer was a very elegant man. Understand? He's the king's wine purchaser. And wherever he went, he would read aloud the section of his work that he was writing. He would read aloud to the royal court that was there, because he was always a guest of royal courts, but also the wine merchants, and because his father had dealt in, in some other commodities, there would be a lot of merchants around. And so the Canterbury Tales is made to be read out loud to a jovial group of people who are letting their hair down in the evenings, sampling the best wine that there is, which one is the best so we can get it for the king. So it's under this humane, lovable, lively quality. And Chaucer has that. He has that. On the other side, Virgil, in the Aeneid, is a severe, serious, masculine relentlessness because the Aeneid was commissioned by the founder of the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar. The Greeks were great because they had the epics of Homer to base their civilization on. You write me an imperial epic which I can found Roman civilization on that will last forever. And that's what the Aeneid is. It's the magical formula in epic verse to keep the Roman Empire eternal. <sighs> Very serious endeavor, full of magic. In the Middle Ages, Virgil was called the great necromancer because he did stuff with the Latin language you cannot do. It's like going to the moon. The Latin language was bulky. It was good for engineers who built roads. There was no way you could get a, an epic vision out of, out of Latin, out of Greek, yes. Out of ancient Avestic, yes. Out of Sanskrit, yes. You can get fantastic, beautiful, epic visions out of those languages. You are not supposed to get it out of Latin. It's like bees' wings. It's too blocky. But he did. But he did. And he was wise enough to never turn it in. <laughs> he died first, and then the heirs uh, turned it in. He said to his heirs, uh, burn it. It's not finished. Well, what's not finished about the Aeneid is uh, it's very hard for anybody to see. But he was wise. If you're working for the founder of the Roman Empire, you, you don't ever say the job's finished. <laughs> never. <laughs> As our <coughs> black brothers say, she. <laughs> you got a feather bed, which he did. Here's how the Aeneid begins in this beautiful translation by Alan Mantelbaum. I sing of arms and of a man of fate had made him fugitive. He was the first to journey from the coasts of Troy as far as Italy and the Latvian, Latvian shores. Across the lands and waters he was battered beneath the violence of high ones for the savage Juno's unforgetting anger and many sufferings 
were his in war until he brought a city into being and carried in his gods to Latium. And from this have come the Latin race, the lords of Alba and the ramparts of high Rome. <laughs> so take your choice. You can laugh or you can tremble all year long. <laughs> Don't forget that in reading these, um, you're not to just read them. You're to portion them out and space them out. It's called distribution. I have to tell you a story of why distribution is important. I had a friend named uh, Ravi, who was from uh, uh, Patna in uh, India, is a Bengali. And Bengalis are always fat and jovial and they talk all the time. The greatest con men in the world are Bengalis. <laughs> they're always your friend and they're always making a profit. <laughs> and interest on the profit and uh, bonuses and surcharges. And you're glad to, geez, how much more do you need? <laughs> Ravi, being from India, didn't understand snow very well. And he worked for a Canadian petroleum company. He was a, uh, a, a map reader to interpret geologic structures. And um, uh, so they sent him one time out in the field, because he had to go out in the field for something. And so they sent him up into the Mackenzie River Delta. And um, they flew him in, and then by chopper, uh, chopper they took him to the very place in the encampment. So he had a spare moment one afternoon. And uh, he looked out the window, and he saw this pristine snow landscape off into infinity, to the woods and mountains of, of the northern uh, uh, territories up above um, the Great Slave Lake. And so he put on his warm parka and uh, he went out. He went out for a walk in the snow. And he walked out. He walked out about a uh, mile and a half, two miles. And uh, he was traipsing through the snow. And he got out there. And he began to get a little tired and a little chilled. And so he turned around and started back. And uh, he didn't realize it, but the snow was up above his knees. And each step had uh, been, you know, quite deep. And coming back, his energy level just asymptotically fell off. And he realized that it was taking you know, almost a minute for every step. And the cold is seeping in, and he's getting no nearer to the camp. And he realized that. That's why they wear snowshoes, to distribute their weight so they walk on top of the snow, not stepping down into it, because you exhaust yourself. And you run out of energy. And you can see the warm camp right there. It's right there. And you cannot get to it. <laughs> Fortunately, somebody noticed him out there. In order to teach him a lesson, had let him get to the stopping place. He was a full mile away from it. He had completely run out of energy and exhausted. He was freezing. And so they went out with snowshoes. And they taught him that you wear snowshoes. You have to distribute your weight. In reality, with things like the Canterbury Tales and the Aeneid, you have to distribute your weight over a whole year. You're never going to finish them unless you do that. So in order to help you, being good schoolmaster, I have portioned out both of them so that there are weekly readings of just a few pages each week so that you can get through them in a whole year. So use this as a distribution guide. This way you can do it. I have done everything I can for you. It's not a little nature trail. It's a 20 lane highway, but we don't have any other vehicles in our legs, so we have to walk it. it just as if it were a nature trail, but believe me, I've been over it a long time. In this house, six times already. And before this, many times before. Take, let's take our time. Let's take our time. Reminds me of a dirty joke. <laughs> the old bull and the young bull are on the ridge. Yeah. <laughs>